Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we are at the start of our full day of sessions for reinventing the classroom. We've awaited this day. We're very excited, and we're especially glad to have Shelley Terrell here. Shelley. Thanks to ClassFlow for supporting this event, making it free. Go to ClassFlow.com. Also, when you finish your survey at the end of the session, there's a link to ClassFlow. We appreciate that support. And thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for this platform and for the hundreds, thousands of hours that uh, they support each year in this, these free events. So this is a chance for our substantial live audience to indicate where they're participating from. James, Jane, let us know where you're, where you are in the world. Look to the left of the map, click on the star icon, and then click on the map. I'm going to take mine. Oh, there we did it. We did get Europe. That was our hope, given the early hour here in the United States. For those of you who are here, thank you for being here. If you're listening to the recording, we're sure glad to have you participating in that way. So Shelley, I'm going to turn the time over to you. We do want to stop at about five minutes to the hour so that uh, okay. people have a break for the next set of sessions. And then can let me know how I can help. And just like in 10 minutes, like put something in the moderator, because I think it highlights when you do that. So. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. That would be great. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for um, for coming, especially at this time. Um, so I know a lot of people, it, it's kind of um, early for them or really late, and so I got a lot of messages saying that they watched the recording. But I'm really excited to share this this keynote today because it's part of a new book that I'm working on. And this year, I have three books coming out, so I'm really, really excited about that. Um, and one of them is called Bite Size Potential. And what this is based on is actually a conversation that I recently had with a teacher. And when I was doing research for my 30 Goals book um, for educators, which is going to be published by Routledge, um, this year, um, I was looking on the web, and that's what my background is. I started uh, researching, and I started researching, just to let you know a little about me, I have my master's, um, but, and I'll let you know a little about me in a little bit too, but um, I started off uh, not as a teacher, but I started off as a communication major, and my um, passion was really just studying communication and theory, and, and so when I started on Twitter, I tended to get these things really well, and that's what I love to do. So recently, I've been studying different social networks and how the current generation is using those networks. And that's what I want to share with you today so you can get insight into that. And then I want to share with you because I've seen so much, like the cyberbullying. Um, I've seen, like, the pictures that are, are not very good that students are doing. It really concerns me. It concerns me uh, with millions of our students are doing online on these social networks and that the school isn't a part of that. So when I was speaking to a few teachers, one of the teachers said, that's wonderful, Shelly, that you want to do something and that you want teachers to really teach citizenship. But also you should know that there isn't a good citizenship curriculum out there. And I thought, well, what can we do? So that's what Bite Size Potential is about. And those are the ideas I'm going to share with you today. Some simple ideas to teach digital citizenship and make an impact. So the sub kind of um, heading to this is can we make compassion go viral? And this year, that is my goal, is to make compassion go viral. So today, I'd like to invite you to do that with me. I'll give you a few ideas and show you where we can get even more ideas. 
I'm going to take the video off for just a second because my hug is getting a little antsy. So, sorry, I have to take a, a – just let him out really quick. <laughs> I keep forgetting it's about his, his time when he usually wakes me up. Um, there's a picture of a TV for a big reason. When you think about, um, when I think about technology, and I think that's what it goes back to, we really need to look at that. And for our, what, and I want you to think about the first time that you experienced the Internet. Because for me, that was really profound. It was in 1996, and I'm going to share with you that particular story. But think about what it was. Like, where were you? Do you remember the day? Do you remember the time? Do you remember how much life became different after you had go, um, you were able to have the Internet? Because I'm going to share with you my story. I'm Mexican-American, and my grandfather, uh, it's an amazing story because um, my grandfather, he was born in the 19, early 19, um, like 1930s, 40s. And my grandfather got to see all this profound technology. He got to see the first, you know, when TVs came out, he had this experience about what life was like before a TV. And then just imagine them getting this box. And, and, and for Mexican Americans, that was a big deal because we would have never been able to be introduced to the world. I mean, you had uh, newspapers, and, but there were pictures. And all of a sudden, you had the world, and they came on screen, and you had famous actors. And, you know, and then my grandfather got to live through that, and he got to see years later the man the first man to walk on the moon right in his living room. And, and I just think about that. And then my grandfather got to live through having the first PC inside his room. My mother shared with me a story, and she said, my grandfather, he's so excited. He was one of my heroes, and he was very excited about technology. Um, he opened the first a, a barber shop and had the longest barber shop in San Antonio, and and that was very tough for Mexican Americans back then to have uh, businesses. So he did a lot on his own, and he put in he learned accounting. He did all the accounting, and he used to do it in spreadsheets. And when they got him for his birthday a calculator. He loved that thing. He would take it all the time. He would write with it. He would sleep with it. It was very, he loved technology, even though he went through all of these incredible life transitions. And for us, that's the same kind of thing. When you think about it, think about how life changed for you, how it changed your rituals, how it changed your traditions, how it changed the way you learn and you communicate. Most of us cannot go without our phones. But imagine what it life was like before you had your phone. You can. You know what it was like. And for us and my family, um, my dad, he's the first one who taught me about potential. And that's the kind of key word I want you to think about here, potential and possibilities, and especially with technology. When we were young, my dad said, you, you, he had five daughters, and he said, your job is you're graduating from college. You're going to be the first generation. And I was the oldest daughter. And so it was 1996, and I remember it was a key moment because I had to, we had to get I had to get a scholarship, and I remember for two years I signed a thousand scholarships, and so I was able to afford to put myself through school. And I walked into 1996, and I was kind of a little on top of the world because I did something really profound. I had just gotten into college and afforded for us to pay, so it kind of like pays the road. And I walk in, and there's this lab full of computers. And for me, that was exciting because we didn't have a computer in our home. We didn't have the Internet. And so when my professor was thinking microcomputers, and it was like 500 people, and he said, you have the opportunity you know, to take the book, and you can go and you can learn the coding and everything, and you can create a website, and that's going to be. And this was the first one. It was on, uh, I think it was on, it was called Shelley's Personal Heaven. It had little clouds. 
um, an animated GIF. <laughs> you re might remember the GeoCity site. And he said, you could do that or you could come to my class and take all the tasks and everything. And you would pass. So I chose. And I would, every day, I spent hours and hours learning HTML and coding. And that became my minor, which was electronic media. And it was, uh, it worked with Flash and all of these things. And I had great professors who taught me web design and things like that. So for me, Technology has always been about the potential and the possibilities. And when I think about my grandfather and how he saw the TV and he saw the man in the moon there and then the calculator and then he got to even have a cell phone. And I remember him being so excited um, before he passed away. Those were some of the memories I had with him. But many of us, that is not our reality. For some of us, it wasn't this wow, we can now do anything in the world. And for our students, that's kind of uh, profound that now they have access. And 100 years ago, um, as someone of my gender, someone of my race, but even a lot of our students um, in the countries that they're in, they would have never had access to knowledge. A hundred years ago, um, they, you know, even before that, uh, when they had the printing press, you might remember that books were only for a certain, sometimes bloodline. You had to be of a certain heritage. So now anyone can go and they can, if they have an internet access, they can go and they can take um, Stanford classes, and, and they can learn from the professors. They can tweet Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it, it's just kind of an amazing thing. But the people who run our education system, it was a different experience for them, and the experience was that they went to the best colleges. They went to Harvard, and they went to um, the top universities, and, and they went to the private schools. And for them, it was a very, for, in a lot of people, it was, very life interrupting. It interrupted their life because they were here and now their three year olds can use this device and all of a sudden it's, it's and in a way it knows a lot more about certain things than they do. And so for some people that kind of experience was kind of tragic. It, it, it really altered their life. And, and so I want you to think of how your experience was and was it a positive or negative? And now I'm going to talk a little about something called the butterfly effect by Edward Lewin. And that's the same thing about this potential. Um, my father was the first one who taught me about potential and my grandfather. But Edward Lorenz went in 1972 and imagine, 1972, they asked him to do the, uh, Washington DC asked him to present his research. And he's a meteorologist and he goes before, um, this convention of all of these, of the American Association for the Advanced in the Science. And he says two things about his research. He did this paper. Um, he's presenting his research, and he says, uh, does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? And he goes and he says two premises, and I think these are really profound. And this is the second thing that was brought to my attention when I did the 30 Goals Challenge for Educators. Um, and a teacher introduced me to this, and it was the butterfly effect. And, and it's in essence chaos theory, but it says mm -hmm. that a single butterfly that basically with the flap of its wing can cause a tornado in Brazil. But Edward Lorenz said, if it's just a butterfly, then imagine something bigger. And he studied seagulls as well. And that was, and he was saying that the impact of that. And then he said, and how about our human species? And I think that's just really amazing to be able to say these kind of things to scientists. And the second point that he said was, not only does it have the power to create that tornado by just that one butterfly flapping its one wing, but the butterfly also has the power to prevent that tornado or to make that tornado go in a different direction. And then that was the second premise. The same, think about if it's just one butterfly and it's a flap of a butterfly's wings, how about the human species? And so these two things really impacted my life, and I really recommend that you read um, Edward Lorenz's Chaos 
theory. So when I went on social media, and this is April 2009, this potential is what I immediately jumped on. And so there was a few things that I have actually uh, found it. Uh, one of these is EdChat, um, which is the first um, rather popular or viral, I guess, um, educator chat, um, and there's, uh, we won a BAMI for that recently, so I'm very excited. And since Ed Chat, there is now over 500 teacher chats around the world. Um, the other one was the 30 Goals Challenge for Educators, and that is based on Edward Lorenz's uh, premise about how we make things viral through the chaos theory. And one of the things about this was that with Edward Lorenz, um, that's what it is. Every single day, uh, I, I mean, well, we, in one year, I propose, and now I get the community, we each propose a goal, something very small, like smile um, at your students or high-five them when they walk in the door and say, wow, I'm really glad to teach you. And just small things like that, and see, when we do things like that, uh, call parents, and especially the parents of the kids that never get called, and say something really great, like, I'm really um, happy to teach your child when the child never gets. And these are the kind of things that we propose and teachers go, and there's more than 10,000 of them now all over the world that do these things. Um, and it's just been really incredible. Like we've seen the power of flapping our butterfly wings and, and the impact that it has made. Um, so really excited about that. And the other is, and uh, I really appreciate Steve for this, um, because this wouldn't come about without Steve, which is the Reform Symposium e-conference. And we are having um, May the 4th on Sunday, we're having our uh, mini-con. So it's four hours, you can get a taste of it, and we're preparing for our July 11th through 13th. A free online conference, just like this one, Reinventing the Classroom. So all of these actions, the reason why I show you this is because I'm one person. And when I got on social network this year is my, uh, I just reached the 50,000 mark on, on Twitter. And, and I now have been to 26 countries. And every time I step in a country, I think about, um, my generation, my bloodline, I'm the first one to be there. In some countries, uh, when I was in Israel, I was under this cave that they just excavated. And they were so excited because I was the first American to ever enter these caves. And it was a big deal. And people really celebrated. There are schools that I go to, and I'm the first American to ever be in that school. So for me, this is what the possibilities and the potential that it's been. Um, Ed Chat, um, I was looking at the statistics for somebody who was doing an article on it, and the reach for just three days was nearly two million. Um, so on social networks, we have this ability to do so much, and that's something now that I'm talking about with students, that anything you publish, if it has the ability to go viral, if they have the ability to be retweeted, revined, reblogged, whatever you put liked and, and spread even to five or ten people, then make sure that it matters. Because what you have is it, 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 it's so much weight. And it's something that you have the privilege of doing that, that you grew up with. Because our students, like us, we will never know, like my grandfather, what it was to have life without the television, what, how that interrupted our life. And our students will never know how mobile devices uh, and, 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 and the Internet and all of this, they won't know what life was without that. So it's time that that's the first step that we do, that we have them carry the weight, have them feel the weight and let them know, hey, you have this amazing, incredible opportunity. You're part of this amazing time in technology where most of the people in the world are starting to have access anywhere, and that's just truly amazing. So those are some of the places that I've been, and um, I'll show you some of the things that I've discovered from that. Steve Ballmer says that the number one benefit of education technology is it empowers people to do what they want to do, be creative, productive, and learn things that they could never do before. And so it's all about this potential. 
Think about how mobile devices have impacted your routines, rituals, and the way you learn and communicate. Let's go back to that experience. And does this, this experience, whether it was good or bad, and for many of us, it was a bad experience. It, it really made us feel insecure about our own knowledge. And I understand because the first time I gave my three-year-old my iPhone, and it took me forever to kind of discover these apps, and I hear the story again and again, and it's not that our students are digital natives. It's, not, it's just that they don't know a world before that. It's like when we turned on the TV. I remember when my niece was three, she knew how to program a VC are. And why does she know how to do that? Because that's what she was born with. And that's what her students are born with. It makes sense because this is the world that they are born in. But it's also the world that we now, this is the way we learn. It's not separate from the school. It's, it's us as well. What do you do when you want to know something? You Google it. You post on Facebook and you ask a question. You tweet. That's what we do. We don't use our college notes. We don't, all our lectures that we ever listen to, when do we ever take those notes that we took then? Even if we learn from some of the greatest professors and we think they made a profound impact, when do we ever use that knowledge? When do we ever open our textbooks and use it? When we want to know something, we don't. We Google it. So we Google it. Then why don't we expect, then why are we shocked when our students use Wikipedia and Google? Because it's exactly what we do. It's easy. It's fast. This is the world they live in. And if they don't know anything else, because when schools decided to leave technology out, then they produced a generation of students who were not able to be in a digital journey with their teachers. And, and for me, this is a very scary thing because I've seen the impact. There's millions that it's impact with cyberbullying, with um, the pictures that they post up, and we'll take a look at that. Um, so does our past make us teach more like this on the left when our students are learning like this? I did a, a survey. I run a lot of open online courses, and in one of them, I always survey just because I want to know. And I surveyed 179. Well, there was over 500 in the open online course, but um, 179 took the survey in 52 countries. And 56, more than half of them, didn't teach with mobile devices. Okay. Um, and this wasn't for mobile learning. It was actually on, they created a, a textbook, their own personal textbook. And this was in February of 2014, okay, so this is very recent. 39% <laughs> um, reported that, in fact, mobiles were allowed at their school. So we have a whole, a majority of teachers, or at least half, they choose not to teach with mobile devices. And this isn't a pick on in teachers because you being here shows that you really care. Like, I just love when teachers are, are at these, uh, come to these, even if there's one or two or three, because it's like, wow, you're the reason why our generation, why, why students aren't completely like, because if it's not taught in schools, that means that you're doing that. You're showing compassion. You're showing care. And, and that's what the point of this, the potential that we have to even spread that compassion and care. And so I really celebrate. And I think the reason why, this is the, one of the main reasons, and, and it's great that we have conferences like this because they attack the problem, is teachers don't have any training. They don't have a curriculum, just like my friend who teaches 178 students in Texas. Um, and a lot of them are very, very poor with uh, different languages. He does bilingual education. Um, but even they, at 11 and 12-year-olds, they use Snapchat, they use Kick, and all of these these. Um, devices, and that's the reality. When you walk in the room, and most of your students have already talked to each other, and they've already beaten each other up or with words, or or, or that they've and things they've done online, or they've celebrated them and made them feel good. And that's the reality. Each of us walk into every single day. So, um, and that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with students who already are in the impact of that. Um, so I want to help teachers. I want to give them this kind, and that's why I have um, bite-sized potentials out there. Um, so when I did this previous on Sunday, I did a couple of polls as well. 
94% of the attendees had said, the teachers, that they used Google when they wanted to search. So that's why I was um, asking that. David Crystal, he's a linguist. He's in, in phenomenal. I love what he writes, and I'm maybe trying to get him to be one of the plenary speakers for RSCon because he says so much. And what he says is that with our new technology. In fact, our students are literate. They read and they write every day. And you think about it, every day you're writing, even if it's, if it's, and, and it's actually a good kind, because if you think of Vygotsky and he talks about chunking your learning, that's what our students do every day. And 140 uh, words uh, are characters, even us, that takes a lot. You're summarizing, you're taking all of this, and you're sharing little narratives of your lives. Every single day you do this. So think about, even if you send a text message, that's writing. If you're reading other people's tweets, if you're reading their Facebook messages, that's reading. Um, if you're searching online, then you're doing your literacy every single day. And some of our students are addicted to this literacy. And some have asked me, well, if they're so literate, then why this and that? To take, uh, to do text speech, they're translating in other languages. Um, they're doing things like emoji dick and, and things like this where they've translated Moby Dick into all emojis. And that takes a lot. So think about a story you shared today with someone. What was the last thing that you shared about your life? Whether you went to the grocery store, whether you drank a latte at Starbucks and it was a new one, or whether you saw this thing and it was just really crazy or someone stole your sparking face. Think about how you communicated today, how you shared a little bit of your life today, and where did you share it? Was it Facebook? Was it through a picture on Instagram? Was it through text messaging? Was it through Twitter? I mean, was it through this webinar in the chat box? Because this is how we communicate every single day. And, and so now we have this kind of disconnect because in schools, this is not what we are teaching. This is not what we are making the medium for. Yet ourselves, this is the way we learn. This is the way those who make education policy, this is the way they communicate. So part of it is our own digital literacy. And what I encourage you to do, and even in the book that um, I just did this with the 30 goals, one of the activities is take one of these social networks you don't know. Look at Vine, look at Tumblr, look, because these are where our students exist now. It's not always going to be Snapchat, emojis. Take one of these. Scan it. Look. Who are the leaders? Who are the most followed? How do they communicate? How many times are they spread? How many people do they impact? And, and start to learn the culture because that's what I do. And as a communication theorist, that's what I love to do. And when I got on Twitter, um, that's one of the things that's like, the, uh, I was seeing the statistic and it was like in a year I had 18,000 followers and people are always asking me that. But it wasn't that I tried for that because the things that I say and I feel very blessed to be able to do this is this. Can we make compassion go viral? And, it, and for me, every day I wake up and I think, wow, people follow me and, and spread this. So, you know, for me, this is a really big deal because you know, I uh, now I'm followed by, I'm one of the, one of the hundred people Army Duncan follows. And I tweet that man now. I put the ad sign and I put different like articles and I say, does your administration at least, you know, support this? And some people tell me a lot, no, Shelly. And, they, you know, they write all these things like, no, he's not going to listen to you. Why do you waste your time? Because I think, well, maybe one day, you know, who knows? What does it hurt? What does it hurt for me to send a tweet to Ivy Duncan and say, hey, you know, he follows me, so apparently he looks at my work. I mean, and that's the thing that we have to think about is, is we can't discredit small action. We actually have to take that because there's no research that we're going to do on it. But if we're spreading kindness and everything like that, we know that the negative has gone viral because we see cyberbullying and all of that. So I think it's very important that we begin to learn this and we get to see what our students are doing because the part of digital literacy and citizenship that we have to learn, we need to know the culture, we have to see their habits, because part of that is making them into new habits, creating routines. So, for example, 
and they've even researched. And um, in, in March, they came out a candidate, a Canadian research, and they found that American medical journals, over a thousand of them, had cited Wikipedia, and that's a big deal. And I believe that's because we don't have digital literacy in school. And so this is something, well, how are we going to get our students to go away from? Then the question becomes, how do we get them not to use Wikipedia? And some of the teachers would be, well, why wouldn't they just go to the work cited at the bottom? And why wouldn't they click and go to the original and cite that? That's so easy to do because they're not taught that. If they were taught that, then, and then that would be a solution. We could easily say that. But then we can, when we think about how we want to change the behavior, my, what I suggest for teachers is have them curate, teach them to curate. If they like Pinterest, then have a Pinterest, a group Pinterest in your class. If, if they like something like um, a lot of students now curate with Tumblr, they actually use that as a curation. You'll see they have all these pictures and uh, things like that. So take what they might like and get them to curate because that way when they want to research something and if they have a collaborative bookmarking, then, then they have an option and they have a mobile option. They have something because it has to be able to be like Wikipedia and Google. It has to be where they can go and they can access it in their device. I now tell teachers, if you lecture, if you have a textbook, anything, the most valuable type of learning is any learning that they can take to go, anything that they can access on their mobile device, and it's quick and it's fast, um, and it meets their needs. And the great thing about curation is especially something like Pinterest, we may not find it very great, but our students is very visually pleasing. And if they like it, yeah, exactly, teach kids to curate with the tool of their choice. And there's a lot of options, and they'll teach you because my students teach me all the time. So I'm going to teach you a few things about this culture because I want to tell you that our students now live in a viral culture. They understand, and they are viral themselves. And they grew up with um, one of their heroes, if you think about it, is Justin Bieber, a 12-year-old. He was found through YouTube. He was on YouTube. And that's a lot of experiences for our students. There are thousands of our students who now make money, who are now top followers. And I'm going to show you examples of that now. Um, but they are lived in a world where viral is a part of the culture. They grew up with American Idol. And I've been to 26 countries. And there's, an, um, there's a, a Greek Idol. There's a British Idol. I mean, there's an X Factor. That's everywhere. So they see people their age do things all the time. There's kids that are making apps. There are kids that are inventing things for cancer. There was an eight-year-old who just got a, a, a reward because, um, uh, recognized because one of the things she did was she changed the font in the government and saved the millions of dollars just by changing the font. And the kids are doing great things every day. And the sad part is it's outside of school. And one of them, Jack Andrade, who just did it with cancer, he was doing a keynote and he was talking on, on one of these um, shows. And when he said, my teachers made finding cancer harder for me. My school made it harder for me. Um, they gave me more homework. They said they didn't care about my research. That was not part of the curriculum. And it really breaks my heart that that happens in schools, that when our students want something that passion and something that they can do and something they're going viral already, that we don't want to be a part of it. We don't want to make it good. We don't want to spread this compassion. So um, one of the most top networks in Vine, Vine is a social network where you do six-second videos. There's um, over 50 million Viners. The top viners, the top people in social networks now are no longer celebrities. Um, in, in Vine, the top one, he was 15 years old. He's now 16 years old. Um, his name is Nash Greer. Um, and all the people in Vine are regular people. They're people who just, they're, they're musicians. They're, and I studied Vine for a while, and it's one of my favorite social networks. I love Vine. Um, I'm a lurker, and I join. But one of the things is Nash Gruyer, um, all of them. Now, they make $10,000 to produce Vines for Nike, um, for um, all of these companies. They actually now make. Um, and I often think if that's something they love to do and they're so good at it, you look at the six-second videos and they're phenomenal. You're like, how did they do all this? Because I tried and it's, 
it's, it's very hard to do this. But this is their passion. And you know what? Making $10,000 in a six-second video, why would he need to go to school? He doesn't because he gets knowledge from there. They make him better with it. Um, and if we don't teach them compassion, he has 7 million followers. For them, you know, for me, yeah, you, you know, 50,000, it seems like a lot. For our students, that's not a lot. They get 7 million followers. Imagine being 16 years old and having 7 million followers. Imagine being 12 years old, getting discovered on um, YouTube, and, and rightly so, Justin Bieber remains his first record, My World 2.0. Because that's the world that our students live in. And every day they're doing great things and they're going on social networks and they're doing so much. And we need to be a part of that. We need to show them. We need to show them how to spread compassion and the weight of, of what they carry, of what they spread. One six-second video, if you look here, 140,000 likes. 73,000 shares, rebinds, that means like retweets, that means 73,000, 8,840 comments. That's just one six-second video. So he's done 154, 7 million followers. Nash Creator is not the only one. And, you know, I love it when, uh, and sometimes, you know, I always do these things like these free Friday webinars and I share things like this, like a um, 100 things to do with Vine or things that they're doing. And, and, and um, I share what other teachers are doing because I really celebrate when teachers do this. When they're teaching on Instagram and all of this, I, I celebrate it because I love that they're daring to do this, that they're learning about it, and, and they're using tools that students love, and, and they're helping them. And one of them that I really love is uh, General Electric. General Electric has done this, and they have made science viral, which I think is amazing. Um, they do six-second science. And now the language for our students is hashtags. And it's important that we learn about hashtags because that's one way to help your students make things go viral. And we want to make them have compassion go viral. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this quick um, around the world. I happen to find, um, I talk to students, and they blow my mind every day. So this is the video that I'd like you to see really quick. I'm going to mute my mic. Um, but this is Juliana, and she's an 11-year-old Brazilian blogger. She blogs outside of school. And something that her and her uh, friends do in Brazil uh, that spend the time, and I interview the students that I work with. And um, she did this outside of school, but they ran their own, like, Tumblr of um, fashion tips. And every week, there was a group of them, and the whole school would wear whatever they suggested. They did all this research on magazines and everything. So here's Juliana. I'll let her tell you. Um, if somebody can play that, please. Okay, hang on, Joe. Let me grab that link. Okay, sorry. I, just, I thought I'd click sure, but I didn't. I don't know if it's just me. We're back. 
So that was Juliana, and you can see her talking and saying she loves Instagram a lot. So I'm going to show you some other, uh, where other places that students are going viral. Um, and so blogging. Blogging has really changed a lot. We have microblogging all, and this is the way they go viral as well. But in all of these, they have hashtags. And hashtags really are what spread a lot of this, even on Twitter. We see it on Facebook. But um, and Tumblr is one of these things. And there's a lot of our students, and what they do is they talk their animated GIFs. Um, and so you can see here, they take a GIF, and a lot of them will make the GIF, and sometimes they get them from movies and stuff. And here you see the notes, um, 78,000 notes. That means that it, that has been shared. This has been shared 70, uh, more than 78,000 times. How do they share it with this reblogging? Speed through here. You can see all of it. If you click on it, you'll see with all the reblogs. And that means resharing these tumblers. Um, so now let's try this, because a lot of us think that it's not digital literacy, but it is. And so I want you to try some of this. So what they do is um, it, it's this kind of culture and language. And they talk in chunks, and it, it's really interesting. So what they do is they share an animated GIF, and they say something like, um, this is how I feel. So in this one, it was so funny because he talked about, we'll go back, and what he does is he talks about, um, his teachers, a lot of times they talk about their teachers, and so I think that's very interesting, too. So he has this guy dancing, and they took, obviously, this from a um, newscast or something. And he says, I'm not, when my teacher says I'm not assigning any homework tonight, this is me. And he's just, like, dancing, you know. <laughs> and then he says, and then he, re he finishes with the teacher says, so that you can study for the test I'm giving you tomorrow. And then you see he put a sad face on this animated GIF. And animated GIF, if I were to show you, if you went to this Tumblr, you'd see that it's actually moving. You see the guy dancing and stuff. So I want you to try it in the chat box. When my boss says, or when my principal says, or when my director says, I'm like dancing, okay? But then he says, and then I'm like, so like, for example, um, uh, one of the teachers, when I did this in a previous session, wrote, when my principal says, on Friday we have no school because we have an in-service all day, which is a perfect one. Like, that's, that's a perfect example, you know. <laughs> so you can think of things like that. You can put it in the chat box. You can see it's very, very hard. Another is YouTube, and YouTube is one of the only social networks where students go viral, and it will continue to be like that. Um, I had the opportunity to go visit this a wonderful lady, um, a great friend of mine, in this little small town in Ogil in Croatia, because part of my job is I go, and I go to different places uh, where I say, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm the first American to ever visit in some of these uh, places. And I travel a lot, and I take over the classes because the teachers, I help them with their, um, and a lot of times their countries will take me to go find grants and stuff to bring in Americans. And so I'll go, and um, I work with it because the teachers, after I train them, they want to see it in action. So I'll do a 45-minute lesson with their students on mobile devices and usually BYOT. And so I got to work with Mariana, um, and then I got to stay with her and her kids. And so, of course, I did the thing where I asked them and interviewed them. And one of the things, because <laughs> 12 inches of snow, great one, Jay. <laughs> and one of the things, I met this little boy here, her son. He was nine at the time. And I loved him because he said I had the most beautiful smile he's ever seen. So, I was, I, I, him and I were good friends. <laughs> but he started teaching me about being a YouTuber because at nine years old, he's a YouTuber. He has uh, Snake Gaming 12, and you'll see that he was one of my followers last week. I'm trying to help him. He uh, started his YouTube channel on April 29, 2013, and he does. And him and his six-year-old brother know perfect English. They have no accents or anything. Um, and they learned it straight from YouTube, which I find so amazing. They, they learned it. And when you hear him, he does all of these machinimas. And um, they're on Minecraft. He goes and he makes these screencasting. And he tells, you know, he started in April 29, 2013. He's had already 10,000 views and 104 subscribers. This is a nine-year-old who started this.
Um, and that's another example. Here's another one. Um, there's all these personalities, and they make money doing it. They make actually quite a bit of money, and they're asked to do things. So there are students everywhere um, that are making their own YouTube channels and everything like this, and they're starting to get paid for it and everything like that. And, and again, I think we really need to be part of this. This is one of my favorite ones that they follow. Her name is Gold Pink Style. And she has so many different followers. Like her, 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 her views, this is one of the newest ones, but she's already had, she has over uh, nearly 300,000 people who subscribe to her YouTube channel. The other way that they go viral is through memes. And memes is um, imitation. It's when we imitate either language or we imitate action and we spread it and make it go viral across culture. So you've seen things. It's an idea or behavior or a style. And things that you, or it can even be an act or a symbol, things like YOLO. Um, it's things like uh, when people say some phrases and stuff like that. And I'm going to show you. So, for example, one of these, um, how many can you name? ROTFL, rolling on the floor laughing. That is viral. A lot of people knew that. You might be uh, recognized with, um, this from Urkel. Did I do that? So, a lot of people often say it. They imitate it in conversation and stuff like that. So, that represents a meme. You've probably been part of a meme, a flash mob. If you've ever been part of a flash mob, that's a meme. It, um, a bunch of people imitate this and put videos of it. Um, Matt dancing, that's a meme. And Matt going around and dancing, so many people get it. So there's um, a lot to do that. Now there's image memes. Um, they go viral. And there's so many. And there are teachers who actually are teaching this. Um, with them. They say the rules this way. Um, when I train my teachers online, and I'm always running, I have like three or four classes going online. I'm actually a professor in Madrid, and I teach online uh, to teachers. Um, but um, this is what they have them do. Um, they make memes and things like that to show a lesson or something like that. So talking during the test, ain't nobody got time for that. And so you take the same kind of phrases. Um, and you add your own spin to it, and that's what our students do. So your turn. Create one. Take one of these. Keep calm and, or, you know, the success baby, or, and there's um, knowyourmeme.com, and it'll tell you the history of all of these so you can know what it came from and, and the history behind it. It's like an online encyclopedia of memes. So we only have a few times, so let's think about, Potential and possibilities. How do we spread and make compassion go viral? Now that you've seen this viral culture and what our students are already doing. <laughs> Keep calling. <us. laughs> Thank you. So, so great to have you. Who's going to be one of our ArsCon keynotes. I'm really excited about that. And to lodge. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people will now tell you that we need to have students publish it. That's a given. We need to go beyond that. And so one of the things that I, I would suggest when we have students and we talk about citizenship, and I think it's very, as you can see, they're already doing things that are very profound. And like I tell my students, first thing, we need to make them feel the weight of it. Say, hey, you have this access. We never had this in history before. You are part of one of the greatest times in technology and in the world when many, many people around the world doesn't have not where you're born anymore. You can be, you can be someone that is born that is in, in, like me. We were born in a really poor place, and nobody in my neighborhood, we didn't even speak proper English. When um, my dad snuck us into a good school and he used to drive us and he lied about the area, um, I got picked on a lot because I couldn't speak proper English. I learned a dialect called She, Chicano English. And so for me, when I became a public speaker, it took a lot for me to become a public speaker. A lot of people worked with me and mentored me. Um, I had to put markers in my mouth. I had to go with the speech therapist to be able to do this. Um, so it's important that we let our students know this is a weight that you carry, and everything you produce, everything you spread, that if it has the ability to impact somebody else, 
then you have to make sure what do you want to spread? Make sure that you spread something worthy, a good message. Um, and I really believe what John Ixit says. It's time we start teaching compassion and citizenship. The most exciting breakthroughs of the 21st century is not because of technology, but what it means to be a human, and we need to teach our students that. Every time they publish, and we do need to make them publish, whether they're six or three or five or everything, whether it's in a blog or anything, and every time they publish, I want you to drain in their mind. I want you to have them recite. And this is something that you don't even have to transform your curriculum. You take less than five minutes a day. Have them recite until they get bored and they're like, oh, rolling their eyes, teacher. How will they, this make other feel? When I publish this status update, when I publish this Instagram picture, how is it going to make Bobby feel? How is it going to make Judy feel? And do I want to be responsible for it? Because like Patrick Rosa says, everyone tells a story about themselves in their own heads, and that makes who we are. We build ourselves. And, and one of the things we can have our students learn is just like we study um, diaries and letters and all of that, these, our status updates, our Facebook, our tweets, all of that, a hundred years from now, people are going to study that. And that's what they're going to learn about. And, and, and what are they going to say about you? What are they going to derive from our society on, on what it, reading your social networks? And that's one of the ideas that I write about in the book. One of them is that they take each other and they become these kind of uh, archivists and they go through their social networks and they pretend themselves, they pretend they're an outsider reading and they have to go through their Facebook or whatever it is. They can pick a social network and they start as an archivist or as, as somebody from um, the future coming back and looking, and they start studying their social networks, like their communication, and they pretend that it's not them, that there's somebody else. Somebody else saw it and what they would come about with themselves. So they have to study their own social networks and messages, and, and they have to write, uh, a, like, a research and tie it in. Um, and that's something that they can do. You know, they can make an infographic or anything about it or an essay, and they go back and they start they start looking into that. Um, and you can even show them, like, letters and stuff that we study from the past. Another one is kind of like I got from Eduin. And what it is is create a hashtag or every day celebrate something good in their social network. So, for example, in Vine, one of the things that I love, um, there's one of the top Viners. Um, he's um, Ryan McHenry, and he did this kind of viral Ryan gossiping thing. But anyway, he has cancer. And when he went through five weeks of chemo and he, he did it successfully, he came up with the hashtag, Dance With Your Pets. And um, he got tons and tons of people on Vine to make six-second videos of them dancing with their pets to celebrate um, him going through um, his fifth week of chemo. And I think that's something beautiful. And every day, that's what you can do. You can have your students um, use a hashtag or something and tweet. This is what I saw on Instagram. This is and, and to start finding random acts of kindness and celebrate that and look at it. Um, share heroes that are doing things. So Justin Bieber, and I'll show you something. You know, he's done a lot of things that haven't been the greatest things. Um, Miley Cyrus, all of these that have, you know, kind of gone viral. And, and they're not heroes. Um, but there are some, like Kid President. He's eight years old. He has over a million views on his 60 videos. And he does really amazing things. And really, um, if he had time, I'd let you see those. But share heroes like that. Let them see people who are doing viral things that are doing good things, like Kid President. They can do public service announcements. This is one of the girls who did a six-second public service announcement on Vine. They can do it on YouTube. And have it to where they work together to try and make it go viral whatever message they want to spread. So I'm already going to end because it's about that time. Um, but one thing that Justin Bieber said, and he's the leader of this generation. He's one of the first ones, 12 years old. Um, after that, he paved the way. But one of the things he said in one of his bios is he said, my world got very big, very fast, and based on a lot of sad examples. People expect me to get lost in it. And little did he know that he kind of spoke a prophecy for his generation. There are too many kids. There are millions out there, cyberbullying and all of this. It has gone to shootings. It has gone to knifings, all kinds of crazy stuff in schools. And it is because we don't 
peach. So we can do small things every day. Take that um, butterfly effect and really help our students begin to feel the weight. And, and we can do small things in every single day. And so that's what I'm going to do with bite size potentials. Um, more ideas, more like, uh, you know, 50, 100 ideas if I can come up with that are simple to do, something that you can do in a day, do in 10, something like, how does that make someone feel? You know, have them recite that every day and have teachers really get um, and do like a hashtag too. I haven't figured out the hashtag yet, but hopefully it'll be coming out this year. So thank you so much for being here because it is you, teachers just like you, that come to presentations like this, that spread the word, that make all of this. You share, you go and you spread your wings and it's just a beautiful thing and you're the reason why our generation um, and kids, why, why there are people like kid president, why there are kids that are doing cancer and because they did have somebody believe in them and more than likely it is a teacher like you. So thank you so much. And that's the end. And um, if you need anything or anything, you can get me at Shell Terrell. That's my Twitter. And I'm always sharing on um, my blog as well. And you can find a lot of it there. And you can even find my books and samples of them. And often, I even have free ones. So, <laughs> um, so thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Shelly. Thanks for getting up early. That was really a lot of fun. Love listening to you and hearing from you. I'm going to turn off the recording.